he's on. Okay. Do I do sound or is all good? Uh, I think we think we're all good. To turn it around in four years and and then get to the final was quite an achievement. Um, obviously, we we just fell at the last hurdle. I don't think anybody thought, well, actually, we've got to change this because we've just got to do it slightly better and take our chances. Playing a relatively sort of tight game, but we just felt we had to, to, to do a bit more to beat Australia. I don't personally have regrets. I know some of the players do have regrets that we changed the, the way we played. Winter Winterbottom was the definition of a tough and brutal rugby player. While small in stature, he could certainly pack a punch with his tackles. As many kids are these days, he was inspired by his father to play the sports that one day he would represent England for. I started playing when I was, well, properly when I was 11, went to uh, away to school, but uh, I had uh, been involved with the game before. Um, my father was involved heavily at a club called Headingley, which is now Leeds, and um, and so um, I used to go down there and spend time playing with my friends in the dead ball area and learning how to sort of catch and pass. And so that was my first in, in sort of introduction to rugby. Um, as I say, then I, I went away to school and, and um, then played, played it properly. Peter faced many hurdles on his journey to playing for England particularly one in his final year at school. So I was away at school in Lancashire and, and I, uh, I didn't make it. I made it to the final trial actually for, for England that year, uh, but didn't get selected. Um, the following year I was uh, working on a farm back in, in, in Yorkshire and I uh, played for England Colts, which was under 19 then, but if you were in full-time uh, employment. Um, and then uh, went away to college, um, had a couple of uh, games for Exeter at the time, and um, and then came home and and then was lucky to get selected when I was what 21. The 1991 Rugby World Cup campaign did not get off to a dream start for England, but just like a male lion spirit, they dominated the rest of the pack and found themselves in the final against Australia at Twickenham. I mean, in the first game of the tournament, we lost to New Zealand. Um, you know, closely, but it was a, a loss, and uh, and then we we slowly got better and better, and then the quarterfinals we hit, we went to Paris, um, and and we played pretty well out there. We we started to sort of develop our game, uh, you know, the intensity of our game, and um, and so we we beat France in Paris, and then we had to go up to um, Scotland to play the Scots, and that was uh, I think it was a nine six victory. I mean, it was close. It was very close, and it was a really tough game. But you know, I think from those tough games, you sort of uh, you, you you gain a, a confidence that you know you, that you can tough it out. It was a good run to the final, really, and um, I'd say a few high games. But um, yeah, England would go on to lose the final by a score of twelve to six in front of a packed Twickenham Stadium. But what emerged after were rumblings that they had changed their tactics for the final, a decision that possibly denied Peter and England of World Cup glory. I, I sort of, it's a long time ago, I could, don't quite remember exactly um, sort of who initially came up with the idea. I, th I think it was, it was something that everybody bought into though, because we, 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 we didn't think we would be the Australian forwards. You know, we, we knew that we were good, good forward pack, but we didn't, you know, to win the game and, um, you know, by beating their forwards was going to be a big ask. And so, um, you know, we, we felt that it was probably a better idea to to play a little bit more expansively um, than we had done previously. Now, bearing in mind, okay, we'd won the you know the semis and the final, uh, the, the, the semis and the quarter final, um, but you know by playing a relatively sort of, sort of tight game, but we just felt we had to, to, to do a bit more to beat Australia. Sure. Um, you know, and as it happened, um, you know, obviously we came. We didn't. We came second, but you know whether we would have actually beaten Australia had we played it differently. No one will ever know, obviously. Um, you know, I, and I, I don't. I don't personally have regrets. I know some of the players do have regrets that we changed the, the way we played, but I don't because I. I don't think there's any 
proof that you could have we could have beaten the Aussies by playing in the forwards. So even at half time when you guys were nine 0 down, was there any anybody in the dressing room who sort of thought maybe we should go back to, to how no, we were trying to play? No, I don't think there was because we we'd been playing so well. We had uh, we, we won you know had most of the possession. We'd been moving the ball well. We'd been creating things and. Um, you know, I don't think anybody thought, well, actually, we've got to change this because we've just got to do it slightly better and take our chances. You know, we'd, we'd created quite a few chances that game and, um, and not taken them. Um, and the Aussies, I, I, I'm trying to think whether the Aussies scored in the first half or second half, but um, I think it was the first half that they scored. Um, and that was one of our mistakes in their 22, where they managed to kick it down the pitch and then a ball a, a line out and, and drove over from the reaching a world cup final in any sport is a huge achievement and something that doesn't happen every week after the loss the mood in the dressing room had flipped from confidence before the match to distraught and despair the guys were shattered at the end i mean mentally and physically just completely drained and and uh, you know it was very emotional um in the dressing room afterwards you know some some big sort of hard english forwards were taking a bit of strain trying to hold back the tears because you know you 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 just don't get opportunities to win world cup finals every every day you know it's something it was it was it was something everybody had worked towards for four years and um and you know and we just didn't quite get over the line and uh you know so i think look when you look back at it now you sort of think well 12 years later the, the boys went down to australia and and, and won it um, you know, and you think, well, actually, we could have been the guys who won it first up uh, in '91, but but we didn't. I mean, with the, you know, the, in those days, you always had a dinner after the game, so we went, we went, we went to the dinner. But actually, um, a few of us, myself, Mike Teague, Wade Dooley, and a couple of others, we we didn't even go to the dinner. We went to the pub, and just, you know, I mean, I had no interest in sort of talking to anybody really after that so it was just uh, we just went and drowned our sorrows yeah Winterbottom retired from rugby in 1993 and was inducted to the Twickenham Wall of Fame in 2005 Peter worked in an international finance company before returning to the sport as director of rugby for Isha Rugby Club I've been in, in the role about four years now and um I, I coached here previously about 20 years ago and, um, and then stopped for various reasons and, uh, and was op offered the opportunity to come back um, and, uh, and I'm director of rugby so I have to basically organise the, the rugby as such and, and have I guess overall responsibility for what happens. Um, you know I have, we have a number of coaches as well but uh, you know, realistically the buck stops with me and um, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, I suppose my main job is to make sure everything's organised, um, that we're we're playing in the right way, and 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 the culture of the of the squad and, and the club, um, mm. you know, across the board. I mean, that, how important do you think the culture of any sports team is? To this? It's, I, it's massive, massive. I, I think it's probably the most important thing. Yeah, you, you know, you, you you've got to in a, in a team sport, especially like rugby, you, you you've you've got to have um, guys who are honest with themselves and honest with their teammates, and and uh, you know, and you need to build a is that that sort of culture of of, of honesty and, and accountability, and um, uh, it's very easy to sort of go away from the that 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 type of culture. It's um, and it's hard and you've got to keep working on it and you, you know just little things are important you know people turning up on time for example and you know that, that sort of thing that every little thing is important and alongside his role at Isha Peter is heavily involved with the Doddy Weir Foundation and himself and ex-teammates have something very special planned for next year I um, got involved uh, with, with Doddy um, 2018 when he was diagnosed I think the year before um, and I run a, um, a one-day sportive up in Melrose every year uh, for the um, for the charity. Um, we, we also we well, I also organise a, a, a number of other um, cycle events, and the, the, the charity we all we, we raise money for now is, is just Doddy Doddy's Foundation. Um, and next year we've got 
the big one, we're going to cycle across the states. So myself and Mike T, plus a few others, are going to cycle from San Francisco to New York, and um, which will take us about 36 days. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll manage it and um, raise a lot of money for the charity.